12.03, Dr. Lou is here again. Luigi Nally back in the chair for another uh, episode of uh, the Dr. Payne Show here. Talk Radio AM 640. It is 416-870-6400, star 640 on sale. Your phone calls, you have problems, you're having issues. Uh, friend, roll over yourself. Give us a call. Don't be bashful. We'll take care of it here. Dr. Lou will be uh, will be all over it because we're getting close to that time of year in just a few months where the slips and falls are going to start happening. They Weather gets ugly. Start. Yeah, they're going to start for sure. A lot then of you things. get uh, you get wickedly busy. Uh, so we want to talk about um, again the email address we put out there is info at paincarecanada dot com. Info at paincarecanada dot com. Uh, during and then after the show, you guys get a flood of emails from people and uh, they have concerns. Sometimes they they write them through email, not uh, necessarily phone calls during the the hour of the show. But uh, Anthony's here, and uh, your brother. You want to take care of a couple of these and some some interesting ones you had this week, right, Anthony? Yeah, we got one this week from uh, from Marie in Toronto, and it starts off. Uh, there was a caller on your show, Doctor Lou, who asked about a hip replacement. This is referring to last week's yep. show, and uh, she continues. Uh, if if she was a real caller and not part of the show per se, I'd like to reassure her about the outcome. Mm-hmm. And she goes on to give some some positive information. And of course, we welcome that of our callers as well. They don't have to just have questions about current conditions, but if they have a a success story that, right. that they want to share with other people so that other people can benefit, this is what Marie did. But the thing about this email that really caught our attention is is the line, if she was a real caller and not part of the show. Right. And it got us thinking that... You know, I guess, you know, Dr. Lou's kind of kind of quick, you know, the calls come in and he kind of <laughs> has an answer. He always has an answer, it yeah. seems. And they're pretty <laughs> thorough answers. And it, it I, I can see how Marie might think uh, it's set up y- yeah, it is. to plan. You know, no, you call in and, it, you know, Dr. Lou, today we're going to talk about this and this. So make sure you study hard on that stuff right, or right, right. have some have Dr. Google ready on the screen. And the fact of the matter is. We have no idea who's going to call, no. when they're going to call, what they're going to call about. Mm-hmm. So there's no way for Dr. Lou to prepare. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, uh, Dr. Lou's kind of a sharp cookie. Yeah. A sharp cookie? A smart cookie? And, uh, and, now and we're and talking cookies. <laughs> and I hate studying. <laughs> a good baker? <laughs> 416 870 star 640 on sale. Those phone lines are, are open. So uh, anything this week that was uh, was interesting came across the clinic, yeah? Yeah, we had a couple interesting cases. Um, Let me try to think back here of anything that's uh, kind of a highlight. I mean, the biggest thing that I'm finding um, overall is that there seems to be the mismanagement happening. And it's interesting because one of the businesses that I run is actually a medical assessment business Mm -hmm. where we do what's called independent evaluations for insurance companies or personal injury lawyers. And why these independent evaluations essentially exist is merely to get an independent opinion from sure. someone else. And a lot of the times in these independent assessments, you have someone who's totally independent to you, the patient, and you have someone who's actually listening to you. You're not being as dismissed as you might be with a practitioner that you uh, have seen over and over again, right? You build a relationship. Sometimes they're a little dismissive of the things you say. And these independent evaluations are truly meant to look at what's being missed. Right. And it's funny because I always think in, in, in what we do, we have insurance companies and we have personal injury lawyers uh, doing getting these independent assessments yep. or a second opinion, but very rarely does the average person think that they can go on and do this. And so this is what I'm offering to my patients is this type of independent evaluation where, you know, they have an issue. They're not really sure what's been going on. Uh, they've seen a couple different people and they'd like to get down and really try to understand it. And so I have a comprehensive assessment protocol where I go through with patients, uh, full history, a lot of questionnaire type things, uh, full physical exam and any other special testing that's required. And basically what we try to figure out is what's been missing. And and we look at the whole picture. And based on that, we make these independent uh, recommendations that might be fulfilled with something that's more physical, like physiotherapy or chiropractic or massage therapy, as we talked a lot about Last week, a lot of the times it could be the psychosocial aspect of treatment. But I think that's the the biggest thing that's that I've been finding is as, as a common theme anyways, with the with all the people that I've been seeing as a response to this show is that there seems to be a little bit of an outcry on uh, proper management and getting to the root answers. Because you've mentioned before that, you know, there's there's nothing wrong maybe with your specialist or your GP, but after they've been treating you for a while. They kind of get pigeonholed. They kind of get blinders on to looking yeah. outside where and, they already and have that, been. And right? you know what? Sometimes they don't, 
right? There's no, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is only a specialist or only a GP. Mm-hmm. It could be anybody. It could be your chiropractor. It could be your massage therapist. I just think sometimes when you, one of the things when I was going through school that we were often told was don't treat your, your, your family and your best friends because they're people that you know, you've gotten to know so well that you'll be dismissive of some of the things. It's just the, the human right. condition, right? You're going to be more dismissive of people, you know, because you think you know what they're going to tell you anyways. And so that's what ends up happening. It's no one's intention ever to be dismissive. I think it's just human condition, and that's where a second opinion really comes in handy. Because you don't know any of their history until you, you start don't know, digging, yeah, right? You got, I, these people that I'm meeting, I don't know them, right? So I have to sit there, I have to talk to them, I have to find out about them. And in doing so, I have to listen versus if I knew them, and I'm not suggesting to the patients that I already treat that I'm not listening to, but I think it, it could happen to any healthcare professional. This isn't something that's just one profession or another. I think that this is just part of the human condition. 416-870-6400, star 640 on your cell. Want to uh, get into this one? We'll we'll talk. Uh, well, you know what? Let's just go across here. You gave me these notes, so we'll start with this one. Uh, discussion we'll have for the next little while. Again, want you to chime in on the phones with this one. And I know you've got an opinion on this. That's discussion of health care. Are we really a public system, or is it more of a two-tier? Because I know this can be controversial, right? Yeah, it's a very controversial. I think we're, we're very much made to believe that, you know, in Ontario and in Canada, that it's a full public system. But the reality is, over the last few decades, a lot of things have become delisted uh, through the the Ontario Health Insurance Plan. And so in doing so, that means either people have to pay privately for uh, certain aspects of their health care, or they have to go into third-party payers in order to pay for those things. And I'm not suggesting that that's a bad thing. I'm just suggesting that there seems to be some taboo nature around uh, when people have to dish out money for their health care. And it's one of those areas that when you really stop and think, if you're not as a person willing to spend money on your health, what are you really willing to spend your, your money right. on? Like what more is there than your health? And so, and I don't, and I don't blame anybody out there for this. I just think it's the, what we've been socialized to believe in the system that we're in is that healthcare should be free. And in doing so, um, you know, we, we sometimes mismanage ourselves because we don't want to spend a little bit of money out of our pocket to get that better access to care. That is available because, in my opinion, I think we're more of a two-tier system, uh, even though I'm sure a lot of politicians out there would disagree with me. But based on what I see in my office and what I see with patients, I do believe it's much more of a two-tiered system where certain aspects, yes, are covered through the provincial health insurance plan, but other things you have to go into your pocket and, and or you have to go into your third-party payers. And, and we all know what they are, you know, the optometry, dentistry, mm-hmm. chiropractic, physiotherapy. And there are exceptions in each, right? Some some things will have up until 18, it's covered through OHIP, and then right. it changes. So there are, there are exceptions, not everything. And that's, but that's, in my opinion, the definition of two-tier, right? If it wasn't that way, it would just be a public system or it would be a private system. We'll talk a little more on that when we uh, take a short break. You have an opinion on that or you have any concerns uh, for yourself physically as well. would love to hear from you. 416-870-6400. Star 640 on sale. The Dr. Payne Show right here. Talk radio, AM 640. Yep, yeah, call that number anytime. 416-870-6400. Star 640 on sale. You can email Dr. Lou as well, info at paincarecanada.com. So, yeah, we're just uh, we're just finishing up and touching on the healthcare system. I mean, you know, people say, I love free healthcare. Have you seen your taxes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen your... Nothing's free, kid. No, no, You nothing. know what I mean? What's your opinion on a two-tier system, more of a two-tier system? I mean, I mean, the argument I've heard is, you know, it's, it, it's you know, it, the people who are against it will say, well, I mean, it's, you know, those, those who can't afford it can't afford to get into that yeah, uh, top yeah. tier. And then the ones who are like it say, yeah, but it's going to take pressure off the off the system. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's pros and cons both way. I, I don't know that I agree one way versus the other way. Right. Uh, I think there's, uh, as an example, right, when you make the amount of money that you make is obviously going to contribute then to your yep. health care, right? So then it becomes a barrier to those that are in a lower bracket of income. And is that right? Probably not. We should have a certain, uh, all have a certain level of access. Uh, on the other hand, when it is a, a private system, I think when it comes to the healthcare professionals, there might be a greater motivation in terms of payment for them and how they go right. about treating their patients. Because I know a lot of people out there that are stuck in the public system treating. There's not necessarily uh, all the time a lot of money in it. And that, I think, diminishes the amount of or the quality of care maybe that you give, right? Like, right. you know, a lot of things. I also think the onus falls back to on the population. I think a lot of things are mismanaged and we don't understand how to use the healthcare system. So one example that I always get is I'll often get people who come in and see me 
And they'll say, you know what, yesterday I was at the emergency room all night because my back flared up and they, uh, they ran a, an x-ray and they sent me home and they didn't do anything for me. Right. And it's like, well, what did you want them to do? It's an emergency room. The very definition is that they're there to save lives, right? They're not there. Uh, and that's, that's their job, right? They're yep. there. They're, they've determined that your low back pain is not an imminent threat to your life right now. You can now go home and get it managed through the rest of the system that deals with that, whether it's your family doctor, your chiropractor, or whomever. And so yeah. there's that mismanagement on, on, on the people, right? How many people are going in because they have a simple cold and they're not understanding where they should be going. They're not understanding, you know, what the the primary healthcare professionals, like the paramedical stuff, I'll call them, like the chiros, the physios, what role they can play, uh, what role a walk-in clinic can play, what role an urgent care center can play, and then what role a hospital plays in their care. And so I think a lot of it does have to fall back on better education. Better education, I was going to say. And that's one of the reasons why I want to be here doing this. And, and, you know, if I can help change this in any way and make people understand, it will improve the system just by the very simple fact that people understand where they should be going. And I think a lot of people, you know, when when push comes to shove if it wasn't you know an exorbitant price when you're in pain and it's like you know you got to wait five weeks to get an mri you did you wish you go down the street corner and pay you know a couple hundred bucks for one right like you do anything for that at that point and and i'll be honest there's been people that have you know patients that i've had that have driven down to buffalo yep and they and they'll go get an mri there because for them it's worth spending that money to, to have that peace of mind and to know and so yeah there's it's it's very tough to say i mean if we were a full private system We'd be having the same conversation. Is this is this good or is it bad? And and likely there's going to be two sides to every argument. And some things are good and some things are bad. Uh, I think that uh, you know we have to as as a society keep looking at this. I also have to, I would also say that we probably have to look at how much can OHIP sustain because the right. reason why a lot of things get delisted further and further is because of the sustainability of this. And so that becomes: Are we going to increase taxes to provide that? More? And do people want mm-hmm. their taxes increased, or do we go more towards uh, a two tier private system where you know healthcare is also covered by work plans or private insurance or? Uh, out of your pocket, right? Yeah. I, I, I just know I have a lot of uh, relatives in, the, in Texas and Florida and New York, and yeah, their hospitals may look like hotels, but man, oh man, is it expensive to get anything fixed down there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You do and, not want to get sick or break a leg down there. No, and, and also the sad part is, you know, people that may need it, and if that insurance card isn't ready, they don't help, right? And so, uh, and then there's, you know, there are different centers for people who fall in who don't have the private system, but I think it diminishes the level of quality probably yeah. that you're going to get just because of the very nature that I think uh, if a healthcare professional has a choice, the private system is probably a little bit more lucrative uh, than the public system. And right. so you would lose some professionals, I believe, to that private system. Should so a, it's a tough conversation. Should be a right, not a privilege. Yeah, this is, this is definitely, right. you know, the hour that we have is not going to do it justice. You I think it. Uh, that... Yeah, it's it's there's pros and there's cons to both ways, and uh, we just need to keep evolving and, and figure it out as a society. Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty on cell. We're going to take a quick break. Get back into this one. Why humans feel pain, emotional and otherwise, and physical? We'll get to all that in just a moment. You want to give us a call? We'd love to hear from you. Phone lines are wide open. You want to call Doctor Lou outside the show as well? That's one eight five 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 Doctor Lou. Very simple. Doctor Pain, right here. Talk radio AM six forty. It is 1222. Dr. Payne Show. Dr. Lou is here right till 1 o'clock, 416-870-6400, star 640 on cell. Lines are wide open. You have pain concerns, pain management. Talk about it here, personal or for someone else or otherwise. I want to mention as well, Facebook guys, Dr. Lou TV, and that covers Twitter as well. That's, That's right, your social media, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. Anthony's in charge of all that stuff. Nice. He's the marketing guy. Look at you. The Facebook page is cool. You should be going there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And if people want to see a trailer for the upcoming TV show that's Which you guys are working on. Year, yes. Which is awesome. They can see a trailer trailer All on right. the Facebook page. Nice. All right. I uh, want to get into this one. This one uh, might get your phone calls happening. Uh, marijuana for pain relief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a hot topic. What especially. Think about that? I definitely think, again, it, it for sure would uh, would play a role uh, okay. like everything, right? I don't think anything should ever be discredited. Uh, and I think it does play a substantial role in a lot of people's pain management. I think the bigger thing that we may need to be concerned of as healthcare professionals and as a general public is how do you distinguish someone who just wants to smoke up to smoke up right. and use pain as the excuse versus right. someone who has pain and really needs that to help them. And that's that's a, a more difficult uh, question to, to to tackle. But yeah. I think you know one of the, one of the best things 
one of the best ways to understand this stuff is I'm sure we have listeners right now who might be using marijuana for pain management and let's let's get them to call in let's hear what how they're doing it and and let's see if there's a benefit if there's no benefit and how much it's changed their lives and and on that front I'd love to hear about all kinds of things that people have done for their pain management and things that they have have worked for them because you know when when Anthony was speaking about that email we got earlier in the week about uh, the reassuring the hip replacement patient yes. I think it's really important, too, that if people have had good experiences, that they share those experiences, uh, because I think that provides a better outcome to people who may be considering that as an option for their management. So whatever that may be, whether it was a surgery that you had or you're using marijuana Mm -hmm. or you're taking a certain medication or you're trying some alternative type of therapy that seems to be Found something that works, Yeah, something that works. And let's, let's try to, you know, tackle that and see who it could and could not help. If that's you, give us a call. 416-870-6400, star 640 on cell. Left off the last segment saying this, why humans feel pain? Describe yeah. that for me. Yeah, we often talk about pain as also a vital sign because in order mm-hmm. to be alive, you probably have some level of pain. And um, that's really what it's there for. It's really to identify you of some type of danger and so that you can make the change, right? If you If there's a fire behind you and it's, burning your skin, there's going to be nerve fibers that tell your brain, hey, something's going on here. A a pain signal goes off in your brain and you get out of there. So it is, it is there to potentially save your lives and things like that in more serious things like cancer, where there's a pain component, uh, it's there to let you, to tip you off. There's something wrong. And that's really what it's there. It's just a tip off. It's a siren bell where it's like, hey, something's going wrong and you need to do something about it. The problem is like we've talked about many times on the show already is the pain pathway that's developed. And this is the concept of neuropathic pain where okay. where that pathway is similar to you learning to riding a bike and not being able to forget it. That can happen with pain. And that's the dangerous part about uh, the pain signal is when and, you know, there's a lot of things that contribute to how that pain signal is processed, right? People, we, we spoke with a couple of people last week who seem to be hypochondriacs, right? And so when you're, when you're focusing on that pain all the time, you, and there is something to be said about distraction from that pain and helping you to forget it. So uh, it's such a broad topic, right? And, that, and that's why we're here discussing this week after week. What do you feel about as far as someone being in pain, depending on, on, on the source of the pain and what it's leading to, um, I don't want to use the word masking it, but remedying the pain. I've always been that, you know, if you have an excruciating headache, of course you're going to take something because you can't function. But, you know, if you've got a bit of a you know sore head or a bad neck, sometimes it's just, do you think the grin and bear it thing has a little bit of a play into it? I, I personally don't like taking pills. I don't like mm-hmm. taking medication. That's just me, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, I, for example, yesterday had a, a really, really bad headache in the morning and I took two of Tylenol because mm-hmm. I needed to. And, and I'm, I will try to stay away from it if I can. And sometimes I will try to push through it. I think maybe, and you know, what I did yesterday was my headache started. I didn't pop two pills right away. I waited. Yeah. And you know, I said, okay, is I laid down for a little, like a couple glasses of water, yeah, a couple yeah. glasses of water. I had a little bit of food. I'm trying to figure out, okay. And once nothing else was working, then I went to that. So, you know, is there a part where people should toughen up? It's hard to say. I think it, it depends on the individual sure. case. It depends on the individual, what, uh, what their story is and then you can kind of determine okay is this person doing it just to use it as a crutch Mm -hmm. or is this real because some people the reality is some people just use it as a crutch right 416-870-6400 star 640 on cell got uh, john and peterborough good morning john or good afternoon how are you hi i'm good thanks good what's your question um it's not a question i was just going to say i got offered medical marijuana for arthritis in my knees as a pain management strategy and i turned it down because i don't uh I don't want it to stone, you know. Okay. Right. Have you, John, uh, have you ever used marijuana outside of that? Like in high school uh, once, and then I realized. Okay, so it's not something that you've done uh, repeatedly? Because I was going to say, even if you weren't going to take the prescription, when you have done it recreationally, have you found an improvement uh, with your pain levels? Um, You know, it's hard to say if there was, it was. It was overshadowed by that sense of lethargicness and uh, right being stoned, basically, yeah, being right? Stoned, yeah, right, yeah. And that may very well be the distraction component of it that we were just talking about. Maybe right. being stoned distracts you from your pain and therefore helps in that way, right? That that may very well be uh, a way that smoking marijuana might help. What are you? Uh, what are you? What are you using for your pain now, John? For arthritis. Yeah, just yeah. he's on Tylenol, right? So yeah. that's the alternative. It's either pills or whatever, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's like anything, right? I, I don't think, I think it's dangerous to say there's, 
you know, plenty of people that I've seen that have used alcohol as a coping strategy to their pain. And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we'll tend to look at that and say, ooh, that's bad. But, you know, alcohol falls under the same category as any other drug. Right. So mm-hmm. so I don't think you should be and I'm saying this for everything. I don't think you should be reliant on any one thing for your pain management. I would even say that for my patients. I don't think that they should just be relying on me all the time to help them with their pain. There has to be an active component, the stuff that they're doing outside of that. Right. No addiction to anything is good. 416-870-6400 is the number. Got uh, John in Ottawa. Good afternoon, John. How are you? Hi, not bad. You? OK, what's uh, what do you uh, what's on your mind? Well, I got a problem. My wife has sciatica, and every time we try to have intercourse, uh, it acts up. And Lou, is there anything, Doctor Lou? Is there anything that we could do about that? Hmm. How bad is? How long has this sciatica been going on for? This is about four and a half years. Four and a half years. Uh, do you know what the sciatica is being caused from? Is it like a disc herniation or a tight muscle? Has anyone ever given her? Because sciatica is kind of like saying the general fever, term, right? Right. Yeah. So, okay, well, what's causing that fever? What's impinging on the nerve to cause that problem? So what I'm basically trying to get at here is, let's say it's something like a disc herniation, and let's assume that it's what's the most common type of disc herniation, would, which would be off laterally a little bit uh, in the spinal uh, in the in the spinal canal. And being in flex postures at the hip mm-hmm. would aggravate that type of a right. disc herniation. So depending on the position you're using for intercourse, if there is some type of a flex pelvis position, that may be aggravating the sciatica versus if you use, and I mean, it's, I guess it's kind of hard to think of a lot of positions where you don't have to be a little, <laughs> a little bit bent, but yeah. maybe limiting the amount of bending might help in that regard. So uh, we've tried different positions where we're e- you're either spooning or whatever the case may yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's still the same. So I don't know. I'm, that's why I'm looking for options or any ideas that you might suggest. Yeah, I guess this is where it comes down to. I'd really have to assess it properly and, and ask some more detailed questions that I'm not sure would be really appropriate for the air. So I, I'll invite you to give us a call at the one eight five five Doctor Lou number, and uh, we can help you from there and kind of have a more private discussion. John, that number one eight five 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 Doctor Lou one eight five 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 Doctor Lou. We'll get to lots more of your calls four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty on sale. Dr. Payne Show continues. Talk radio, AM 640. 416 870 6400, star 640 on sale, 1233 on a rainy uh, Saturday. Good day to uh, give us a call and discuss uh, the things that are going on in your life as far as your health care is concerned. Alan in Mississauga, good afternoon. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Yourself? Okay, Alan, what's, uh, what's on your mind? Well, I uh, just wanted to give you a little experience with marijuana. I have an elderly father who suffered from shingles. So for two years, uh, he had pain in his arm, wouldn't go away. We tried a lot of, you know, the opiate pain medicine. Mm -hmm. He had problems uh, breathing. And then uh, basically we took him downtown. He went to a marijuana specialist, gave him an oil. It not only helped with his pain, but also gave him quite a bit of an appetite, too. Okay, yeah. Yeah, marijuana tends to do that. Yeah. So that's just my experience. I don't think marijuana is a bad thing, like you said. No, nope, uh, not at all. Uh, it, it depends on the person, right? Yeah. And I think that's the point that we're trying to hit home here on the show with a lot of the, the different types of interventions that we're talking about. I think it does come down to uh, being dependent on that individual. And, and it's, not, it's nothing bad. Marijuana is nothing bad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the abuse of it, may very well be bad, like, anything else. like anything else right? right but i don't think as a standalone it, it's necessarily a bad thing and again if it, if there are people out there uh where it is helping and it's making that difference in their life so that they can have that quality of life then i think hey well, there's nothing wrong with it i think so much of it's you, your demeanor i mean we were talking just off the air during the break that i have the, i have the type of personality where i don't like being out of control yeah so yeah. i never smoked weed in school i never tried it i did it a couple of times since i've been an adult and i'm like okay i don't like this feeling that much yeah you for know? sure yeah there's people and, who like taking purple mics and seeing spiders all over their walls i don't get it yeah and, and, and that's that's what i'm talking about with disposition i really think yeah. it matters and i think there's something to be said about like even when we look at we all know that story of that you know, 95-year-old man who smoked his whole life and never got lung cancer. Yeah. 
But what's that psychological disposition? You know, there's a lot of people, I think what the mind does is so much more powerful than what we're doing because how many people are smoking and every time they're inhaling, they're saying, I'm killing myself, I'm killing myself. And I'm not, and I'm not advocating for smoking here. I'm just trying to highlight a point versus people who are out there. And maybe that 95 year old man was the type that said, no, it's all, it's BS. This will never kill me. Right. So maybe that mental disposition does help. And I think all those things uh, need to be taken into and that's a big focus of your of your of your practice. Yeah, we try that we, angle, for right? sure. We definitely try to look at the psychosocial aspect of everybody because it's so important to think to realize what psychologically their disposition is and even sociologically what their environment is like because right. environment is so important, right? Four one six eight seven zero sixty four hundred star six forty on your cell phone lines are open. Give us a call, Eric in Toronto. Good afternoon. Hello, how are you? All right, Eric. What's uh, what's your thoughts? Um, I, I, went to, I, I don't know if he knows about the cluster headaches, Yep, which are referred to as suicide headaches. Mm-hmm. I, I try to like, oh, you know, I tried to smoke it and I don't smoke a lot of weed. I tried to smoke weed and it just made it like double the pain. Mm-hmm. Have you, is the, Eric, the cluster headaches, was that something you were diagnosed by with somebody or you're assuming it's a cluster headache? Oh, I know it. it. I can. It starts from the neck and goes up to the ear, and then into the nasal cavity. One eye gets crazy, and basically, wow. one time my wife found me banging my head against the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, it's hard for me to say whether it's a true cluster headache. The symptoms that you're describing do are consistent with cluster type headaches. Uh, you're also a man, which uh, cluster headaches tend to be. Is that right? Yeah, they're more common in men. Um, but, you know, anytime someone says it starts at my neck, this is where now we look at another classification of headache, which is tension type headache and tension in the upper shoulders and in the joints in the neck and the contributing uh, pain referral that those areas can have to the head. And, you know, in Eric's case, he he's saying that uh, I guess that uh, you tried marijuana for it and it made it worse. And I would say that that's the scenario area where you don't keep doing it i think anything that you try and it makes you feel worse you stop anything helped eric sorry has anything helped obviously not the weed but anything else helped um a, a, a hammer to the side of the neck and beating it and like trying to get yeah. that muscle down. so i, I would right. say eric for sure give us a call because uh the this type of musculoskeletal pain and headache referral is exactly what uh, our clinics are really well equipped to deal with, uh, and it's probably not as hard of a solution that he thinks, but mm-hmm. probably some treatment on the neck um, and the upper shoulders could probably play a very significant role. So give us a call. one eight five 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 five. doctor Lou is that number, Eric. It's, the, the body is just a big message board. Just read it's, me. Yeah, it's crazy. Right? Yeah, You just got to decipher the message. Yeah, once I started learning about this stuff, I, my interest peaked at, with health in, uh, in grade, I guess it was grade 12 when I was taking a kinesiology class. And right. ever since then, it's just been, you know, something that I, I can't get enough of trying to understand. And I'm always trying to look at the newest, latest research, how things, and huh. it's it's unbelievable how complex the human body is. It's unbelievable. 416-870-6400, star 640 on cell. We'll get to another call before we uh, take a quick break. Laura, good afternoon. Yes. How are you? Hi. Okay, what's up? Uh, I'm okay. Uh, I just wonder whether you have any idea what could be wrong with me. I'm 70 years old, seven zero. And I suffer from heat from within. Like, I know it's been a hot summer and everything, but I've had this for a while. Mm-hmm. I get really, really hot and perspire a lot, and I'm very tired. Okay. And I think I'm seeing here on the message board that you've been to different doctors who cannot figure it out? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of my questions for you, obviously, you know, 70 years old, so age probably plays a factor in a lot of these things as well. Um, what, because I obviously can't see you, can you describe a little bit about yourself? Are you overweight? Uh, do you move around uh, a lot? I, I am slightly yeah, overweight. I'm not, a, I don't think I'm obese. I do, I walk uh, and I still work two days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I do all my housework and uh, everything with no problems. I don't sure. have any major health issues. Mm-hmm. They did recently find out uh, that I had uh, a thyroid problem. Yeah. That was my next it, question, if they ever investigated it, your thyroid. It's, yeah. a, it's an underactive thyroid yeah. for which I take 15 milligrams of, I can't remember the name of the drug. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, w- I would say, uh, again, from personal experience of my own over the last few years, I'm, I'm kind of maybe a hypocrite sometimes when I talk about being overweight because I've gained a little bit of weight over the years uh, myself. And I noticed, and, and even with a 10-pound or 15-pound difference, now we don't have mm-hmm. to talk about going from you know 150 all the way to 250 and that what that can do to your internal body temperature. But I noticed within myself as a personal experience that even a little bit of weight that I added to myself, I found the same thing where I really? was uh, uh, I felt hotter a lot of the time. I was sweating a lot more. That's just, again, that's your body's sirens going off telling you that it wants you to be uh, a little bit healthier. So I would say if there's nothing that's been serious and you've been investigated in all other ways a simple thing that you can try is try to get the diet under control uh, and try and exercising and see if losing 10 pounds helps at all it's and you know 10 pounds is good for anybody to lose so yeah. i think try it out and see if that helps appreciate the call laura the phone lines are uh, are open give us a call you got some time right till one o'clock 416-870-6400 star 640 on cell dr Payne show Talk Radio, AM 640. 1244, the Dr. Payne Show continues. A couple different ways to reach out as well. Dr. Lou TV, that's uh, both on Facebook and at Dr. Lou TV on Twitter. Uh, Anthony, you got another email. This one's uh, interesting. I want to read this one for us. Uh, yeah, by the way, the from... address, info at paincarecanada.com. And this is from Susie. Hello, Dr. Lou. Have you ever used turmeric or golden paste for pain? And do you suggest diet changes to cut out inflammatory foods like sugar, dairy, etc.? Yeah, to the first part, I personally have never used uh, huh? those those uh, substances for pain management. I don't even think I've ever recommended it to people. Uh, having said that, one of my associates in my office uh, uh, practices Chinese medicine as well, and I know he recommends this type of stuff a lot, and he has great outcomes with his patients. Right. And again, I think it goes back to, especially when it comes to natural substances, there's not a heck of a lot of research uh, because it doesn't have to go through the approval that right. medication has to go through with the research. So there's n- usually a lack of research on these types of substances. Having said that, um, I don't want to say that they're not harmful, but they're definitely not as harmful as other things could be. I do think it needs to be taken into consideration. This is where naturopathic medicine is great because they'll understand really well how these types of things can uh, interact with the medications that you're taking because they, uh, you know, the naturopaths that I have working with me, this is a lot of what they go through because, again, it's integrative, right? You don't want to necessarily tell somebody, take this, take that, and not understand the other things they're taking. And moreover, you don't want to tell them to stop taking the other things that they're taking. The multi-pronged approach. Yeah, yeah, shouldn't be their yeah. call. So uh, I personally, again, I have never recommended them for pain, but I probably believe that a lot of the people that work with me have and have good outcomes with it. And in terms of the diet modifications, absolutely. That's something that I always uh, will recommend to patients about uh, things that are contribute to the inflammatory cycle in the body and which foods those are mm-hmm. and w- and how to eliminate those foods um, from your diet in order to help. And we talked about this on one show where, you know, there's that saying grains and flame. So a lot of grain products, the uh, breads, pastas, anything that's a complex starch uh, contributes to the, the pain cycle. And uh, things that don't contribute as much are obviously the fruits, the vegetables. Right. Um, even alcohol is a contributing factor to well, the sugar, right? to uh, um, pain. But things like red wine and stout beers seem to have a beneficial effect. So, yeah, yeah. Yay! Here's John raising his hands. Get the Guinness. Stop get, beer. Get it what? In right Guinness. Now. <laughs> I knew it was medicine. Uh, 416-870-6400, star 640 on sale. Uh, is it Jamie or Janie in Toronto? It's uh, Jamie. Jamie, how are you? Good. Thanks for taking my call. No worries. What's up? Um, you know, for the last, uh, say, 13 years, now, uh, I was diagnosed in, Aug- well, actually, 12 years, August of 2004, I had um, diagnosed with patella femoral syndrome in my knee, mm-hmm. and I also was diagnosed with arthri- osteoarthritis, and I've been having these, like, flare-ups. I've, I tried changing my diet. I've tried losing weight. But I, I just really can't seem to get rid of the chronic knee pain. And I should tell you that this knee pain, it, it, it's not there all the time. It comes and goes. Yeah. So, um, Jamie, with, uh, with what you're describing, and, yeah. and, and assuming it truly is uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome, yeah. what essentially patellofemoral pain syndrome is, is in a, it's kind of a wastebasket term. It's one of those things where there's really nothing else wrong with the knee, uh, but there's some pain there. The patella, which is the kneecap bone, is meant to track up and down um, 
in the leg and basically is there so that if we didn't have it, our muscles would be snapping when we bend our knees. Uh, and so really what it is is a traction issue with the patella. And ch- this is where uh, getting the right assessment and the right recommendation matters because in something like you're describing, if the patella is tracking the wrong way and it will usually tend to track a little bit more towards the medial side, which is the inside of the knee, you can start to develop osteoarthritis on the patella itself. And, it, and you can notice this in a lot of people. If you look at a young child or someone in their teens and you look at their patella kind of it's nice it kind it's small it sticks out versus yeah. you look at older people and it looks like their knee the bone is so big that's just the the patella has become arthritic and so changing your diet and those types of things for something like that is not going to help as much because this is a functional issue someone needs to look at you look at the way that what you're doing whether it's the way you're walking or some activity that you're doing and figure out where that traction issue is occurring and help to eliminate that problem and also mm-hmm. treat that patella because oftentimes what happens in patella femoral pain syndrome is you'll have an area in the leg that's weak and another area of the leg that's tight so you have mm. to basically The practitioner has to help you strengthen the area that's weak and then help you loosen up the area that's tight. And so I would say this, again, similar to that uh, neck complaint that we had, this is something that we would be very well uh, equipped to help with. And and it's one of the things we see most often in our clinic. And and it doesn't have to be something that sticks around for 13 years. This is something that can definitely be solved. So give us a call. Excellent. Jamie, that number, 1-855-55-DR-LOU. Email is simply info at paincarecanada.com. Lots more of the Dr. Payne Show is coming right up till 1 o'clock. Your phone calls at 870-6400, star 640 on sale. We'll get to Omar after a short break on Talk Radio, AM 640. 12.52, still a few minutes to go here. You want to give us a call, 416-870-6400, star 640 on sale for Dr. Lou, the Dr. Payne Show. Omar, hello. Omar. Hello. Hey, how are you? What's up, Omar? Not much, you. Not much. Uh, you got a question or concern? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Omar. No, just do what you're going to do. I don't know what you want me to... <laughs> okay, we'll let them sort that out. In the meantime, James, how are you, James? I'm fine. Okay, what's up? Well, less than 100%. My, I injured my Achilles uh, about 12 years ago, just a partial tear. Okay. And uh, I still have a bump on it. Yeah, that would... Uh, perhaps uh, an inch and a half or two inches up from the bottom of the heel, and it... Uh, you know, it's sore from time to time whenever I'm, you know, on my feet for a, you know, longer period of Long time period. or something. So I wondered if there's, you know, what I could do to, am yeah. I stuck with this or? Um, I mean, what happens, it's normal for a bump to be there now because scar tissue has essentially mm-hmm. been laid around uh, that tendon in order to keep it safe. The The thing with the Achilles tendon is it's meant to function and slide properly uh, so that you can move your feet and your and your leg. And so when you have something like that, and I'm not really sure what you did following that injury and if there was proper treatment done, but in something like this, what we will often do uh, when we have these chronic injuries of an Achilles tendon, we'll actually induce some micro trauma where we not tear the muscle, but some micro Break tears. it down? Yeah, in order so that we can restart the healing process mm-hmm. properly. So yeah, is it something that you're stuck with? I mean, you said, I believe 12 years, so that's that's a long time. Uh, and it's not going to be as easy as if it was if you called me that and you said this happened, you know, a month ago. So it could take uh, time, but I don't think uh, that you're stuck with it. I think with with a good practitioner who can induce that type of micro trauma and allow the healing process to start again, giving you the right exercises, the right treatment. It's definitely uh, something uh, that I think could get better. So, I mean, James, give us a call. Okay. Okay. Thanks. James, that number one eight five 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 Doctor Lou. Dislocations and breaks. Often her dislocations are worse. What do you think about that? From a pain perspective? Yeah, or from a treatment perspective. Yeah, yeah, from a treatment perspective. Even from a pain perspective, if you fully sever something, there's nothing there to have pain versus if you partially break something or partially tear something, there's still some nerve fibers intact which will contribute to the the pain. But yeah, I, I mean I would say that if you had to choose, you should choose neither. Uh, and I think yeah. it also depends on location of the body, what right. area of the body we're talking about could potentially be broken or dislocated. But uh, one of the things that I see a lot of times is dislocated shoulders and people don't even realize that they have a dislocated how do shoulders. You not, how do they not know? 
it, it's it's sometimes hard. They'll have a fall. I actually, funny enough, had a patient. Uh, I don't think it was this week. I believe it was last week. She's a patient that I treat for neck complaints, and I've been treating her for years. Uh, and she does great. She comes in for her regular care to keep up with the management. And she usually will see me in the morning. And I remember seeing her slotted in in the afternoon. And I thought, hang on a sec. If she's coming in the afternoon, there's something going on here. Right. And she came in and she said, you know, I, uh, I fell and I hit my shoulder. I was raking the leaves and I need you to just fix the shoulder. And immediately when I looked at it, I could see that the shoulder was sitting a little bit anteriorly, which means forward. And I said, mm. I said, I think we're going to have to take an x-ray. And, and uh, sure enough, we took the x-ray and uh, it was dislocated. And, and here in, in Ontario... To put a dislocation back in, you have to be at a hospital setting. Uh, so I sent her over to the hospital across the street from me in order to get it put back in. But now the problem becomes the repetitive dislocations that could happen after because now you start to weaken the structures in that area that hold the shoulder in place. So oftentimes when it's dislocated one time, it predisposes you to dislocating it again and again versus when you break something, oftentimes you'll never break that same area it again strong. because it heals strong. Like weld. With, with bones, there's something called Wolf's Law, which is essentially that area of stress will lay down more bone. And that's why in arthritis, bones tend to get bigger. It's because more bone is being, it's a faulty mechanism. The, the body believes if I make it stronger, it should feel better. And in a break, it works. But in osteoarthritis type of issues, it doesn't work. Which so, leads to bone on bone and pain. Right? Yeah. So from yeah. a fracture standpoint, but I mean, that makes that area of the bone stronger. It may not necessarily make other areas of the bone stronger. Carl, you, uh, you get the final call of the day, my friend. How are you? Great. Thank you. I know you're short for time. Just a quick question. I'm a 58-year-old male. I'm in good shape. Uh, health wise, I have a, I don't know what it is, I thought it was tennis elbow, but when I touch the tip of my elbow, or the out part of my elbow on my left hand, my left arm rather, um, it's sore to the touch and affecting my workout. Is there anything that you could recommend that could uh, alleviate some of that pain? I'll just hang up and you. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, so again, um, when it comes to elbow pain, we got to look at people are, I think, pretty familiar with terms like tennis, tennis elbow, elbow and golf elbow. And all that is, is whether it's uh, what's called a tendinopathy on whether it's the medial or lateral side. So the inside or the outside of the elbow. Uh, sometimes it could be an olecranon bursitis where there's a bursa right behind the pointy part of your elbow uh, that can be inflamed. So, I mean, based on the description that he gave me, it's not, it's it's hard to say exactly. I would say when you're dealing with someone who's saying that it happens while they're working out, it probably sounds more like a tendinopathy tendinopathy issue uh, because it's similar to golf or tennis. Sure. People assume that it can only happen in golf or tennis. Really what it does is because in those in those sports, it's a repetitive action. Yep. And so whether you're doing that repetitive action, lifting weights or swinging a tennis racket, it could be the same outcome, which is the tendinopathy. Uh, and again, if it is one of those things, this is similar to, again, the, the MSK issues when this is my point, when there are these low level things and they're often dismissed and a lot of our callers are saying, what can I do? The first thing you could do is get a good professional to yeah. take a look at it and get it treated the right way so that it doesn't become that stage four pain that I talked about last week where it's so debilitating that it ruins everything in your life. So I would say, you know, give us a call. Again, this is something that we're well equipped to help with. Uh, our network of providers across the GTA so that there's convenient locations all across Southern Ontario that we can get people into and, and get them help the right way for sure. And we'll leave it off there for this weekend. We'll, uh, we'll be back here next Saturday as well. In the meantime, one 855 55 Lou. It's info at pain paincarecanada.com and make sure you check out Dr. Lou TV on both Facebook and Twitter for more and check out the trailer for the upcoming TV show which is happening in the works anyway it's going to be uh, pretty brilliant until next time this has been the Dr. Payne Show Talk Radio AM 640